up on this hill We spoke of was and when Although I wasn't there He said I was his friend Which came as some surprise I spoke into his eyes I thought you died Chapter 7 When Esquire died, the prospect of dual ownership of the Price Empire disappeared with the wave of a pen. He opened the mayor's golden parachute and funded his campaign. He forgot about their friendship. Sam knew who the chairman was from the first time he met him, a horn dog with a refined pedigree. He watched him grow into one of many who ogled his fiancée. The kid was good-looking, but that was about it. He was conditioned to prance around a room, remember birthdays, pay large tabs, and make a call if you begged him. His father's connections ensured that he was socialized with their children to weave a small, powerful web throughout the city. Sam witnessed the charm of the chairman, but remained in awe of how few people saw through the thin veneer to his hollow soul. Sam's eventual role as an in-law made him an interloper in the chairman's eyes. Esquire always understood Sam's aversion to risk, particularly after the Carol fiasco. He knew that Sam could only hit the reset button so many times before ending up alone. Chairman would forego his divorce while his father was still alive. He heard his father's mutterings about Rose and Sam being simpletons, and their willingness to play these roles to feign their place in high society. Esquire was doing the same with the billionaire class. His name remained absent from their rankings, but he was grandfathered in amongst the aristocrats. These men were delusional, and Esquire sunk his teeth into them. He wielded enough power during their collective rise to prominence that they allowed his presence in the room where his wealth was never whispered. Their executive suites, board placements, tenure, and vacation homes stemmed from the influence of the old man. He wished Sam would have taken more chances. Because of his own, Chairman would have the cushion to continue building generational wealth. When Esquire passed, the worth of his assets was surpassing the billion-dollar threshold. Everything about Sam remained stagnant. Even the chase. Samuel, why don't you spend more time on the golf course? Esquire asked. I find it boring. You know this. And besides, I'm terrible. We all find it boring. If you're that bad, there's a perfect chance for the client to feel even better and open up his wallet. I would prefer it to be opened without spending so much time. Golf is a long game for a reason, Samuel. I understand the long game, sir. The goal is to play it on your own terms, no? Esquire envied his ability to stop kissing ass around them and knowing where he stood in that moment. Yet most of these international elites hated seeing Sam by Esquire's side. They knew he provided nothing but a tax break that in turn lined his pockets. He saw himself as Robin Hood, while they referred to him secretly as Willie Loman. When he attended these soirees, he was Esquire's guest. After his mentor's death, the invitations stopped coming, as did the phone calls. The power he wielded in his profession was understood. To assuage their guilt while distancing themselves from poverty, they kept his ecosystem intact with their money. Yet, none of them believed they were doing anything but maintaining the status quo, which was fine considering their material wealth continued to mount. Chairman sought the same approval from his father that Sam received. 
When Sam and Carol parted ways, he saw an opportunity with the woman. He kept it quiet for fear of his father's disapproving eye, but he still sought the playboy persona that escaped both his father and his protege. Sam tried to create one with his own ostentatious quarters at Towers Residential, but most of his parties devolved into networking events. Attendees long not for the beer, wine, whiskey, and charcuterie Sam served, but for the bottle service and seafood towers in the overpriced venues blotting the surrounding blocks. Chairman obliged. His father's charisma was a genetic blessing. Little black dresses and matching heels clicked from the elevators of Towers Residential to dimly lit booths filled with real estate moguls and would seem like one fell swoop. Once the business cards had been exchanged, Sam's parties would end early, leaving an uncomfortable esquire to finish a quiet Glenlivet with the embarrassed and morose young man on many occasions. When Esquire left, Sam would cry, call a hooker, and get a late morning Reuben. On the night Rose first stayed after a party, the sex was dull, but the conversation over breakfast surprised them both. She shared that people for good needed a face to grow, and he was not it. You're the conductor without an orchestra, she said. She knew Carol could play the role, and that that guy Jeff was okay. Sam gazed past her and called out her snobbery. Would you dole out this kind of advice if you had a different last name? No, but I'm grateful for the opportunity. Without a staff or Uncle Esquire's money, Rose would have been taking shots of well whiskey with Sam at the old watering hole during their college days. She was an elitist who got away with it by being aloof. Her childhood was insulated, and Sam wished his had been. Her brain was warped by hours in the kitchen with the maids observing female subordination. Rose was deemed slow at a young age, but she was manipulating the world. Hearing, at your service, from those around her was a secret pleasure. If they believed she had any awareness of the dynamics, they would not work for her. Upon hearing she was barren, her old money family excluded her, most obviously after her father's death. She heard about Sam before attending his post-carol parties. The man was too nice to navigate this world. Prominence among Philly's affluent required a dismissive persona. He faked it, but not well. I met a man the other day, classic Philly development guy, plain spoken, perfect for the job. Rose heard them at the parties Sam attended. Her cousins were gauche regardless of the diplomas hung on their walls. She maintained a quiet, but respected profile, and manned the daily operations of the Price Foundation, so she heard all the gossip about Sam. The man she came to love lived up to his boozing, brooding, well-intended reputation. Their shared self-awareness brought them fortune, but not joy. Soon, they were united only in keeping up appearances. Rose was making more investments, and Sam was making friends across the city. His father's funeral was small and Esquire's presence was humbling, even to her. Their love had an unforeseen purity to it, because it was not tied to their libidos. She looked the other way when it came to the escorts. It was one of the few closed secrets in their world. Not even Esquire was aware. Rose maintained her charade with her families, killing everyone with kindness. She led a separate, freer life in Manhattan and Sam always assumed she was carrying on an affair with her roommate from Fordham. They satisfied their urges separately to maintain a united front as an unapproachable power couple, never too far from cameras' lenses to provide evidence of how much they did not want to be seen. Their elevators were escape pods from reality that shot them into the sky, away from the plight in the streets, to their shared goal of separation from their surroundings. Empathy waned over decades as they unraveled the business of philanthropy. Living the good life came at the cost of the kindness that held most families together. Their isolation was born out of reliance on one another. Most people won't return the favors, Rose cautioned. 
That's not the reason for doing them, Sam answered. Tell me, where is the fairness in being reliable? You don't emote, Samuel. You never have. Having your shit together isn't all it's cracked up to be. You're not doing what you want because something or someone always requires your attention. Imagine someone you know is not fighting cancer, but dying from it. Reality sets in, and of course you play the game of you never know. But you do. And you well up from time to time, holding back the tears. That is why you don't speak to each other about it. You can't grieve because you're tasked with their replacement. That is why they need people like us. We can bottle it up, send a funeral card, and keep moving. Uh, what would you like me to do? Sam's new intern asked. He snapped out of it suddenly. Exactly that. She left, and Sam continued drafting an email to the board regarding the timeline for the construction of the center. He knew he should pick up the phone, but the thought of speaking to her with the reality of death hanging in the air made him avoidant. With no calls to make, he could do that for most of the day. He set his glasses on his desk and contemplated what he knew of this world and this woman who passed. Most of their interactions were surface level, but he understood her and she him. They disagreed about philosophies, but didn't have to take it much further than that. Her death was not a complete shock, but it cut him deep. He became so adept in blocking out anything but the work that the feeling of grief suffocated him. The rush of a wave came over him, and he had forgotten how to swim. Suffocation was inevitable. Excuse me again, sir. Do you have her address? He opened his watery eyes and returned his glasses to his face. The intern appeared in his doorway. Sam wrote down the address and she was on her way. He wondered how long she had been there. He fiddled with his keyboard and typed gibberish so she would hear some activity. The rules of the organization were numerous, but the dress code was the only thing most people cared about. Sam was once full of ideals and hair. Esquire exposed him to the art of perception and the upper crust. The curly mop atop his head shrunk with every fundraising campaign. Sam's father was a teamster, and they shared a first name. Esquire understood the power the unions wielded, and under the guise of being a friend, he maintained a close relationship with the older Pearson. The ruling class enjoyed their arrangement of receiving premium goods at a discount and relinquishing their own duties of having to police how they were acquired. Esquire sent Sam's father a case of booze every year around the holidays, and Big Sam smuggled him a crate of Cuban cigars. I'm proud of your boy, Esquire said. Me too, Big Sam confirmed. They chomped on cigars and sipped a bottle of Chevis in the cramped, smoke-filled living room of the row home where Sam was raised. Esquire used the excuse of making his Christmas rounds in the city to stop by for a midday cocktail with the man. Big Sam was not one for the small talk required to pass the time at the annual Christmas party at the Price Estate, no matter how lavish the spread. You know, when my son was born, Big Sam said, it was the happiest day of my life. I don't need much. Esquire raised his glass to the sentiment. He did not feel the same way about his own boy, but that was not a story to be told. He saw the genesis of Sam's sincerity. Less than twenty years separated them in age, and they were both molded by a tougher generation. Big Sam remembered reading about Esquire in the papers, and his own father was too busy picking up extra shifts at the bar to care. When Big Sam wanted to break free of the Pearson curse, 
he started saving more and seeing his wife less. While he saved for his son's future, Samuel's mother was halfway across the country. Without a phone number or a care, Big Sam said each time he told the story. He would cry privately each night, knowing he would only be able to feed the boy cereal before heading to work and shipping him off to the nuns at the local parochial school. A glimmer of hope came during Esquire's first mayoral run, when the local endorsed him. Big Sam canvassed the neighborhood, handing out buttons and sharing smiles with the working-class hopefuls whom he often served in his father's bar. But, inside the watering hole, the patriarchs laughed him and his candidate off as idealists. Price? What does that man know? He forgot about this neighborhood a long time ago. The eldest Pearson shouted from behind the bar. Take that button off, or drink somewhere else. Big Sam surveyed the room. The old men giggled like schoolgirls, because they were leg breakers for the current administration. They wanted an outward toughness, not the subtlety required to make a change. Get the fuck out of here, one of the men said through a laugh. Boorish fools, Big Sam replied. Boorish? Just call us jerk-offs and be on your way, another said. Are you afraid to have your fucking teeth knocked out? He ain't wrong, Sammy, the eldest said. Lewis Price, Esquire, doesn't know a goddamn thing about the real world. When's the last time any of you stepped into the real world? Big Sam asked. It's out there. A lot brighter, too. A small circle of light came through the bar door's window. Four pairs of eyes were on Big Sam. I was too busy working, the eldest said. Drinking. Big Sam returned. You want to work here? You take off that button, keep your fucking mouth shut, and pour my friends a drink. Don't want to work here? That's fine too. Big Sam thought of his son. He tucked the price button in the pocket of his bar apron and reached for the Lord Calvert. Shots all around for the men his father valued more than his own son. Big Sam buried his hate and took his tips over time. He never spoke to his father after that day, and his dream of sharing Sam's first drink with him in the pub was dashed by a fatal heart attack before his father had a chance to adjust his will. The bar was seized by the bank to pay the old man's debts. No appeal to the candidate he worshipped so made a difference. The bar was soon demolished, and the lot became a small sliver of the ever-growing Price real estate empire. A few of the items that fell off the back of the truck would make their way to the rec center every afternoon. Big Sam was glad to help his son, and the neighborhood. He did not want their relationship to become as strained as his was with his old man. Stay true to yourself, Big Sam told him. Of course, Dad. What comes after the rec center? I didn't think there would be anything, Sam answered. Lewis Price does not remain stagnant, Samuel. Stay true to yourself. There's no way There was no promise made The part you played The chance you took There are no boundaries set The time and yet You wasted still So it slips through your hands Like grains of sand You watch it go There's no time to be lost, you'll pay the cost, so get it right. There's no way out of here when you come in, you're in for good. And then
listening.